the impact of higher education part one. Today's event is going to be focused on the impact of COVID-19 on higher education. We are incredibly fortunate to have two incredibly talented um, and knowledgeable educators who are going to try to help us understand the impact of COVID on our families and students as we are moving closer to the fall semester. Each of our panelists will have 15 minutes of prepared comments. We will follow that by moderated questions um, that we will take from the audience uh, at the end, and we will make sure to leave time for that. Before we start, I do wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors. We have several that have helped us make this particular presentation possible. I'd like to thank Azure College, Chocarella, Optic 21, Francesca Andre Photography, Golden V Incorporated, PG Mix, and PG Mix. Thank you so much to our sponsors. So first I'm gonna introduce myself very briefly. Um, I'm Marjorie Benn and I've been part of NEHP for several years. I currently serve on the advisory board and I also do a lot of work with the education committee. So um, obviously education is my passion. Um, it, it's something that I value very much. Um, I do some teaching in my role as a physician at an academic uh, institution um, in Washington DC at George Washington University where I do teaching of medical students and residents. And we are incredibly lucky to have two special guests tonight. And I'd like to introduce them uh, first. Uh, our first panelist is going to be Dr. Nadej Dadi. Dr. Dadi is currently the Dean of Student Affairs for Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine at the Harlem New York campus. Dr. Dadi provides oversight of the admissions, alumni affairs, registrar, financial aid, and bursar offices as well as manage student life activities on campus. She joined the Turo family from the Rutgers School of uh, Educational Programs in the Office of Academic Affairs. Prior to that, she also served as the Regional Director for the New York City Metropolitan Area Health Education Centers and Director for the Family Medicine Education Program at the Institute for Family Health in New York City. Dr. Daddy brings an incredible wealth of knowledge and expertise, particularly from the world of postgraduate uh, education to this discussion today. Our other panelist, uh, distinguished panelist is Dr. Patrick Lammy. Dr. Lammy currently serves as the Vice President for Student Affairs and Community Relations at Bloomfield uh, College. Dr. Lammy has been at Bloomfield College for 28 years and has served in multiple roles there. He started out as resident director, then as resident life coordinator, EOF counselor, tutorial program coordinator, director of residence life, assistant dean, and now currently in his role as vice president for student affairs. Dr. Lammy received his master of arts in education and human services from the Montclair State University and a doctorate in higher education administration from Seton Hall University. And he's going to bring incredible insight into what awaits our undergraduate students as we look at the impact of COVID-19. I mentioned that we were going to have some prepared comments and then we're going to have a moderated discussion. I'm gonna pass this over to Dr. Daddy, who's going to give us a little bit of insight into what's been going on in the higher education world as COVID-19 unfolds in the spring. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Thank you, Dr. Lamy, for joining us. Um, so as Dr. Brennan mentioned, uh, we're located in Harlem, New York, uh, which means that we are an inner city school campus. Most of our students uh, commute to school. They either live in the Northeast or uh, commuted uh, sort of transition into New York State for school from another state. So when COVID-19 came about, uh, you know with very little time, we had to sort of disperse campus. Uh, so what that meant is that for some students, they went home to either their apartment in Brooklyn, in Harlem, when for others, they went back home to California or Pennsylvania to be with family during classes remotely. Uh, so what I recognized immediately is that there was a physical 
physical, emotional, as well as psychological toll, right? The physical is the obvious sort of not being on campus, uh, the loss of that social network, the loss of access to the professors and um, the ability to just have a quiet study space. So that produced an immediate challenge because students had to renegotiate, well, where am I gonna study? I'm used to studying in the library or in a study room. Um, so, but now because I'm either home alone in an apartment, I have to get used to this new setting. Um, and if you're a student that struggles with um, some mental health anxiety or depression issues, that isolation uh, was very paramount, you know, uh, dealing with that sort of not being with friends amongst colleagues and, and, and the like. Um, and then the other side happened. If you went home to be with family, uh, you're also in a space where you're not studying because the house is filled with others. Uh, whether that be mom and dad or your siblings or your own family, your wife, your, your spouse, husband, wife, and your child, you now have to balance being in a home situation uh, with keeping your academic progress. So both produce unique challenges physically. Then there was the emotional toll. Um, be, as far as COVID-19 had spread, you know that, you know, some students had were fearing for their own medical health issues, exposure, or those of family. Um, and so whether you were fearing both, the outcome at the beginning, no one really knew, especially as we still don't have access to that much testing. Uh, so that was an emotional toll. Uh, some students unfortunately lost family members to COVID-19. Um, and so that was a quick decision uh, through my office about whether they could even continue. Uh, did you need a break? Did you need to stop? Or, you know, can you really go on? And how were you gonna go on, even in the midst of sudden trauma? Um, and then with the economic impact on families, right? Uh, so some family members were dealing with the loss of someone's income, uh, whether that be a parental income or a spouse's income, all of them were really emotional as we were keeping pace with the semester. And then of course there was the psychological. No matter where you are, were, uh, the isolation was paramount, right? Um, not be, you, we're all very used to going and going and going, sort of. Um, that was something to get used to. And for, for them at that younger ages, those younger ages, not necessarily used to having that much alone time. It was, it was, a, it was a big transition. Um, and then there was the uncertainty about the future. There's still uncertainty about COVID-19. Here we are, we thought we had it under control and we're due for another rise, right? Across the country. Uh, so there is uh, uncertainty about the future in general. And if that wasn't enough, uh, during the May and June uh, months, there was the racial tension uh, that was brought on by um, the injustice suffered by uh, Mr. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and, and Ahmaud Aubrey, amongst countless others. Uh, so they were challenged emotionally um, as they were keeping pace. And, and there was just so much going on around them uh, that we really had to step up from a student affairs perspective and a school's perspective to wrap our hands around, you know, hey, we're here for you. Let's, you know, let's get through this together. You're not alone. Uh, so we had to really sort of be creative about how we approach support and redefine that um, and make it as uh, relatable and accessible as possible. Um, so I think students are, there. there's a lot of assumptions because they're young and hey, you know, we went through that too, uh, but there are a lot of unique challenges. We've never had to go through a pandemic 
and uh, as well as uh, of racial uh, tensions in the country and sort of be a student in school at the same time. No one wrote the guidebook on that. Uh, so I'm happy to be here to discuss how we can support them better. Thank you so much for those um, incredibly powerful words. And um, can't hear me? Now, now I can. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for those uh, very powerful words um, and really synthesizing the uh, really incredible stress that um, our young people have been under over the past um, few months um, that uh, beyond losing their school environment, there were so many things happening in the world um, with uh, racial tensions um, and then having, and during all this time to have lost what was probably one of their biggest uh, forms of support. And, um, and I hope we're gonna spend a little bit of more time delving into that um, later on in this conversation. So thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Lamy is going to give us some thoughts on what the undergraduate experience has been like since COVID. <coughs> Dr. Lamy? Sure. Um, interestingly enough, it's not dramatically different than <laughs> what Nunez has shared. Um, our population at Bloomfield is between the ages of 18 and 24. We're a small institution in North Jersey. We serve predominantly um, Hispanic and black students. We're a 80% minority serving institution. So I put the, that into the context of <clears throat> when you have students with the average family income is $33,000 a year, you can imagine the disruption that's caused by COVID-19. The first <clears throat> level of disruption, and this disruption was not only for our community, it was a national dis disruption. But the uh, one thing I noticed is that um, we have to shift online, but our students and our faculty were learning at the same time. Believe it or not, a number of faculty have never taught an online class, and a number of our students have never taken an online class. So that was pretty new for everyone. And when we surveyed our students, only about 40% of them felt comfortable with the switch, which means about 60% of them had tremendous difficulties, whether it was with adjusting to learning or isolation or just feeling unsupported. So our community had to really shift and find out how we're going to deal with the students who are devastated in many ways because they're not engaged anymore. They're not engaged socially, they're not engaged um, personally. For those who were allowed to remain on campus, they can have visitation. So imagine yourself at 18 or 19, um, living in your room, you're only living, living in your room to go eat at the dining hall. Every building is closed on the college campus and you have access to the staff on housing and to campus security. Um, that's if you chose to remain here. However, for our students who really needed to be here to have all the resources that they needed, this was a better environment for most of them than going home. So we had to pivot and allow our students to stay who wanted to be here. A number of college campuses um, forced all these students to leave. We actually gave our students a choice. And if you wanted to remain on campus, we're here. We're going to provide the support services that we can. We'll talk a little bit about that later, at a later time. But what I did learn is that a number of our students did not have the resources to study remotely. And so being on campus was a better opportunity to have access to, um, to Wi-Fi, to technology, and to make sure that the things that they needed, we had to make available immediately. So our shift involved not only um, supporting the students emotionally in some ways, which I'll talk about a little later, but also making sure they had the equipment to learn, to, to get online, to get the laptops, the Chromebooks. We had to do a number of things immediately. Now, the other part that um, I think the audience may want to hear was what have we learned? Because I know there's a scripted a program that we have Here's what my takeaways have been from the past, I guess now it's been four months. It feels like an eternity, to be honest with you. It feels like a year, but it's only been since March. Uh, my takeaway is that um, my staff has learned how to do things more creatively. Um, I learned that there's opportunity to really get students engaged remotely, particularly commuter students, which was um, something that we had not kind of tried before in this particular way. And I also learned that we could do more with less, meaning that um, even though there were very few people on campus, they managed to really 
provide our students with the support that they needed to manage this crisis and to live through this crisis. And I also find that um, I found better use of technology now because we're all on Zoom and all kinds of platforms and um, I miss the human touch. And I think that's what our students also miss the opportunity to kind of sit in front of each other and engage in the ways that we're used to engaging. Um, so to my point is um, the devastation as I'm gonna call it completely over and over again and the disruption that COVID has caused is going to remain with us for a very, very long time. So I look forward to this ongoing conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lamby. Um, I thought it was really interesting as you talked about some of the things that, that you learned and, and it was great to hear how the faculty were learning along with the students that, you know, one of the, the hallmarks I think of all this pandemic is that there's been a lot of loss, but there's, there's a sense that we're sort of all in this together. And it was interesting to me to see you talk about how as a community, your, your college, um, the faculty and the students were sort of all figuring this out at the same time um, through really almost impossible circumstances. Um, having done this now for a few months, and, and we'll get into some more questions in a minute, but I'm sort of curious, assuming that I hope that in a year or two that this is behind us, is there anything that the two of you have learned over the past few months that you would actually keep something you wouldn't change, even when everything can go back to normal? Mm. So that's a, I think that's a great question. Um, and I would say yes. So here were a few experiences. Um, so our medical school was always online. We, we provided, we're a flipped classroom curriculum. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the transition to working remotely was easy for us, but wasn't easy or what I should say, where we had to get creative were in those small group instruction places uh, and, and, and being more creative about presentation, right? Because there's a lot that you take for granted when you're in person because there's, there's more nuanced. Um, so there was a lot of creativity across the board, professors, <laughs> faculty, staff um, in the classroom, advising and mentorship. The, the mentorship and advisement used to happen all day throughout the day at any corner, in the study room, in the hallway, in, the, in, in my office, in the professor's office. So that got removed very quickly. So we were challenged to sort of keep in touch with the students, but we did a proactive approach, uh, a project where all faculty, staff, and, um, and, and faculty and staff together sort of joined and reached out to them. How are you doing? Are you keeping up? Is there anything that you need? Um, that was something that I thought was um, a blessing in disguise because time and time again, you would hear, well, thank you for doing that. That was very nice uh, of you all for reaching out. Um, some other things that we learned, um, graduation uh, student <laughs> affairs is responsible for for a lot of the ceremonies, and um, it includes graduation, wake up, uh, alumni dinners, all sorts of things. But particularly in the spring semester, it's graduation. Um, and there is nothing that's more important to families, right, than attending that graduation ceremony. So when we're looking at, wow, this is going to be virtual, I think it forced us to, 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 to be over the top with creativity. And I think it worked well because you're sitting looking at the screen. When you're in person, there's a lot of adren adrenaline that's happening at those ceremonies um, and that you take for granted. And, and we worked around the clock, but I was happy with um, the outcome because it matched the effort that we put in. That was a great learning experience, an interesting challenge to overcome. Um, and some ceremonies are yet to be determined uh, because we're still looking at what COVID is gonna bring us in the fall. Uh, but that at least we learned through the two graduation ceremonies. Um, the other thing was community service. Um, our students are required to do a certain set of community service uh, and they never stopped. They just looked for different ways to uh, provide support to the community online. 
which was a, a, a wonderful discovery. I think I saw one where they were lining up to call senior, um, I think, uh, senior home residents uh, for those who were shut in and by themselves, right? Uh, so there were opportunities that were created out of the isolation. So it's an interesting, it was an interesting learning curve, but I think there are some definite pluses uh, that we can hold on to. We also have a mini med school on campus uh, for high school students in Harlem. And um, they, if they, with like two more sessions to go, COVID hit and the student leaders said, you know, we're not going to end this year on this note. We're going to plunge forward so we can graduate them successfully. So they did the last few sessions online and conducted a little virtual graduation for this for the high school students. So there were just um, so many um, wonderful things that came away with that. Oh, and I don't want to forget, they added actually a learning session about um, pandemics. Uh, mm. for the high school yeah. students. So I, I was very, I was proud that they challenged themselves and sort of met those needs. Uh, so I think as a school, okay. we really did that. You, 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 you have no choice really uh, because you, you're, there's just so much that you can look forward to. You have to keep a positive um, movement and in, in, in that way you encourage one another. Faculty right. encourage students, students mm -hmm. encourage mm -hmm. faculty and staff and, and the like, so. Right, thank you. Dr. Lamy, is there anything you're going to keep? Yeah, um, interestingly enough, um, not th Dr. Daddy's point is, um, I actually helped had a, our first virtual graduation this year and the feedback from that experience was much better. In fact, um, I don't know if I'm going to depart from that in some ways. I think um, I'm always going to stream our graduation and have something yeah. interactive. It's just like, it was just that great. And, and the feedback from our trustees was that it was better than a past 10 in-person <laughs> commencement. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was interesting. And uh, however, you know, we made a promise to our students. When you're in an in institution that serve primarily first generation students and the idea of their parents seeing them on stage, we made a promise to have an in-person one at mm. some point in the future. Mm. Um, so we have to keep that commitment, but I will say that was a, tremendous, uh, a tremendously successful event. The other thing that I really learned, to be honest with you, on March 16th, I had a staff meeting with my directors. I oversee 10 departments and, and I knew we were going through a, a really unusual place, like, like the entire country was about to go through. And I challenged them. I said, you know, I need all of you to think about if you were to carry out all the things you were planning on doing for the rest of the semester, how can you do it remotely? It was just a general question, general question. Um, the creativity that came out of that was remarkable. I find that we connected with more students. Um, my counseling staff, um, their, their, their intake increased by at least 50 percent based on students dealing with hardship and their, their outreach. Um, my spiritual life staff, the same, my, my residence life staff. We managed to ha um, hold over 60 different virtual programs before the semester was over and engage thousands of students <laughs> in, in a way that um, I would have never accomplished in person. So to your point, what I learned is uh, moving onward, I don't think we're going to depart from this platform and go back completely to the old way of doing things strictly in person. Wow. If can, very, I, can I add yes. just one more yes, thing? That was something that I, uh, to, to Patrick's point about the virtual graduation, you know, graduation typically because, and this really because of the venue, you're limited in terms of certain number of tickets that you mm -hmm. have. But when it's virtual, everyone was able to sign on that they, that they uh, forwarded the, the link to. Uh, so that was an, an interesting plus. It, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that way forever, but it was just, it was very interesting that it actually didn't turn out to be very bad. It, it was good. Well, we all know how incredibly important uh, things like graduation are for Haitian families, particularly when you're talking about 
college graduation or graduate school graduation. I mean, those are just right. such huge events uh, yeah. in, in Haitian families. So, so I, I love hearing uh, your commitment to, to making that still important for these kids who couldn't have an in-person graduation. So you touched at what point uh, actually about the flipped classroom, and I'd like to actually uh, turn the conversation a little bit to academic progress. Both of you touched on that um, in your introductory mm -hmm. comments and, and the stress that distance learning and income disparities of your students and, and how, how you manage that. So unfortunately, as you mentioned, you know, we, we are still having significant COVID rates in this country, and in fact, they're increasing. Um, and we, I, I think, can expect to see at least some degree of distance learning um, across all, all education uh, levels. Um, you know, just, just recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, put out a statement that essentially strongly advocated that when looking at policy considerations for the coming school year, that we should start with the goal of having students. Now, of course, they were talking about kids under 18, so I'm talking about school kids physically present in school. But one of the things that they mentioned is to justify that, which I thought was interesting and is relevant to higher education as well, is because they talk about the critical role of education in addressing racial and social inequity. Um, and also thinking about how there's been a differential impact of COVID-19 and associated school closures on different races and, and vulnerable populations. So with that in mind, um, how are you thinking about academic process as you move towards reopening school in the fall? You know, I'll start, <laughs> if you don't mind, as, uh, as I spent um, most of today um, writing part of our reopening plan. And, you know, uh, and it's, it's difficult because the uncertainty of what is to happen is exactly that, it's uncertain. Mm -hmm. And so you're writing a plan. And um, right now we're, we're, we're talking about having what we call alternative hybrid courses, when students will meet partial time in class, um, social distance, of course, um, with well, only a fraction of the class meeting at a time and the rest of the time online. Okay. Now, that's assuming that the levels in New Jersey don't, don't, don't increase and put us at a position where we're back to March 12th or March 16th, where we were earlier in the, in the spring. Um, we're looking to bring students back into our residence halls on limited capacity. And um, surprisingly enough, the student surveys that we had, there's a lot of interest. I have a wait list for housing, which I didn't anticipate. But I think the population of students that we serve realize that being on campus is important. And so we need to find a way to, to make that actually happen. So, but back to the issue of learning, we think that this platform can work. Um, we know that we're more prepared for it now than we were in uh, March. Um, you asked earlier what we've learned. We've learned that we got to be prepared for the unexpected. <laughs> so now <laughs> the unexpected is now the expected. So I think that we're geared up to open and we also geared up to pivot to do whatever is necessary because what we're not gonna do is not give our students the opportunity to get the educational experience that they came to us for. So we have a responsibility as an institution to be responsive. And being as responsive means that whatever we're confronted with, we need to find a solution. And a solution that works for those who are teaching, a solution that works for those who are educating our students outside the classroom, and a solution that especially works for our students. Thank you. So, Dr. Daddy, yes. Yeah, so I would agree with everything that uh, Patrick said. Uh, like Patrick, we are also in the middle of our planning of what that first few, what this semester is going to look like. Uh, but I wanted to um, just take a different approach for a second um, and to address students who, um, who may find themselves in um, sort of not progressing due to COVID-19 and just to encourage students to step up and visit the student affairs office. That's what we're paid to do. We, we're here to help you and sort of figure what that is like. Um, and so the three scenarios that I talked about is if let's say someone 
um, uh, develops COVID-19 and falls behind, you cannot assume that the professors and student affairs know what your situation is. And so you have to have a conversation to say, can I still make it? What can I do to, 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 to um, catch up? And if you can't, what are your options? I'm only saying that because I find um, sometimes students of color are um, reluctant to come for support because they're too concerned about how they might be perceived or, or um, some other variation of, of, of judgment. But that's not true at all. That's what our offices really are there to do. If we don't know the answer, we know someone who does. Um, and there's always options, but you have to step up and have a conversation. Um, and even in the case if something unsuspected traumatic happens and you sort of lose your way, you again have to step up and say, how can, you know, what, what can I do? Um, and so I think, um, like Dr. Lamy said, we have to meet the need. Uh, we're looking at a hybrid situation, um, medical school. Uh, there's a, a, a different spin because we have to think about the lab components, those places where mm -hmm. we cannot do remote loan learning. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we have to find the ways to meet those requirements. Um, and we're looking at that. And that is about, you know, sort of how do you modify the space signage. Um, so you have to go through all of that with your facility staff down to, you know, the appropriate cleaning uh, um, um supplies. So um, it's a lot of planning, uh, but we were, we're geared up for the fall. We're getting ready. And um, you, you said something so important there too, amongst a lot of important things. And I, and I, and I don't want to lose it, but we'll come back to it. And that is that whole idea of students self advocating and asking for help. And I, I do, we will come back to that because I think that's huge. And I think that you see that particularly in Haitian American communities, where I think some families are sort of used to, you've got to be strong, you've got to work hard, and you certainly don't ask for help because that might make people think that you don't know right. or that you're not mm -hmm. smart enough. And um, right. and so I, I, that's that's so important. And, and I'd love to spend some time on, about that in, in a little bit. Um, can one of you tell us a little bit more about flipped classrooms? I mean, I know what that is, um, but I have the feeling a lot of people in the audience um, don't understand what a flipped classroom is. And I think it would be helpful for them to understand what that looks like for their students and how that's done and how their students can harness that to be more successful. Sure. Um, years ago, the school decided um, that the sage on the stage, the person lecturing at you uh, wasn't really an efficient way of, of um, learn, for, wasn't working very well for the learners. So they decided to convert the entire curriculum um, to, on, to online video. So it looks like um, if you ever watch the Weather Channel, how there's someone in front of a large screen in the back pointing at the weather the latest weather condition except that it's biochemistry or anatomy um, and so the entire curriculum is online students receive it um, in their inbox before class and students come to class for what we call clear sessions which are mini quizzes so you do the learning before you review the lecture before and then you come to class to have a discussion with the professor about the objectives. Uh, so in that way, we feel that we're optimizing learning. Um, and our entire first two year curriculum is that way. Once you move into the clinical sites, that's in person with patients, learning with your residents and all of that. But the first two years are uh, totally online. And so that's what made it um, facilitated our remote learning uh, what we had to shift was the small group exercises and sort of the, the quiz environment. Um, but it, for some students, it works perfectly. Others have to get used to it. And for some, it's, it doesn't make a difference. Um, they actually say that they like having the information 
for themselves because you can review it. Whereas when you see a live lecture, if you're not there, you miss it. You miss it altogether. If you don't have someone who can share the notes with you, you know, that's another issue. But you have your lectures. It's a matter of coming to class to really review um, focused, objective questions that help to prepare you for board style questions. Um, and I want to talk about high stakes exams very quickly uh, because that is a place where students need support. You know, when you have classes and you take exams, these are not these types of exams. High stakes exams are uh, requisite for getting licensure. Mm -hmm. And that's across the board, whether it's nursing, medicine, law, a mm -hmm. business. Um, this is an area that I think um, I want to talk about when we talk about family supporting students, uh, just being aware of the exam schedule uh, and what's on their plate for that week and how important or how pressure filled mm -hmm. is what they're working on. Uh, so the, the our flipped classroom is meant to support their knowledge in preparation for the first part of their board exam, uh, mm -hmm. which we call it step one. I think in, 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 in um, LCME schools, it's USMLE one, uh, but it's an important milestone. And so the flipped classroom serves to support that learning because uh, we're testing along the way. Great, thank you. So you've had to deal with um, uh, di disparities in access to technology before. So what are the, some of the ways that you are dealing now with, with that, especially as your students had to move, some who had to move away from campus? I know Dr. Lammy, I, it was great to hear that you said for some of your students, you just gave them the option to stay. Mm -hmm. um, that they, they could just be on campus. I know that not all colleges and universities did this. Um, and um, what are some of your thoughts on kids who just don't have the access to technology to be able to keep up academically? And also beyond the technology, what about that in-person mentoring um, and in-person academic support that is, that is not available? Uh, it was it's, it was very difficult for a number of us. As I mentioned earlier, about sixty percent of our students expressed difficulty with the switch. <laughs> that's a large number. Um, that's certainly more than half of them. And the first thing we realized is that a number of our students did not have a laptop. I mean, that's that's issue one. Um, how how can you do an online course <laughs> without the basics, which is a laptop, a Chromebook, or something to to use? Um, so we we had to really shift very quickly and order hundreds of them and have them delivered on our campus immediately for pickup. We also had to make sure that our staff in IT were available during the peak of COVID to kind of be, to help students really set everything up they need. We also had to make sure students had access to Wi-Fi at home because not everybody did. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I mean, that was a reality of what we had to, to really address. And what we've learned from March is that now, as we bring in our incoming students, we're asking the same questions in advance, what are your needs? And we're preparing to meet those needs before they arrive. I think that's one thing that we've learned in terms of how we move forward. Um, I don't think we're, I don't think any institution in the country is gonna get caught by surprise <laughs> from, from this point onward with this particular issue. Because I think that we've learned in the past four months that we have to be prepared. And, and, and our preparation has to be one that um, assumes the best intentions for the outcomes for our students. And if they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have a laptop, and then they struggle with just the basics to, to take the online course. As I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna give you an example that really surprised me. Um, and it came from one of my students. And um, they said, you know, we're taking this online course and we're using Zoom and I can't see my instructor. I mean, that, that was like a real, that was like a real issue. <laughs> I can't, I could hear, I can't see it. And I don't understand why, but it really paints a picture of how unprepared some of our students were to just shift this quickly and how the in-person, and this particular class was a math course. So, you know, it's, it's math is difficult enough sitting at a desk <laughs> and, right. uh, and now doing it online. Um, in a way that you can't see the person that you're engaged with, engaged with 
um, creates a challenge that, you know, only few of our students were really able to grasp that very quickly. I think to um, the point to your question, the this semester was a challenge for the entire country, but it was especially a challenge for students who are first generation, not familiar with use of technology and shifting so quickly. It was a bigger challenge for them. Okay. So, so how, so you're, you're, I know you're making your plans for the fall. What was your admission cycle like for this year? And what were the challenges you faced? Um, first of all, because a, a lot of this started unfolding at a time in the spring where students are coming to visit campus mm -hmm. and are making their decisions about schools. And then I, I know anecdotally, there are a lot of kids who are just kind of wondering, is this the right time to go off to college or go off to grad school? How, how has that been playing out for you? Um, so for us, it actually came in um, at the height of our admission cycle. So we flipped um, almost immediately to virtual um, mm -hmm. interviews. Um, and one thing that we added, uh, as we had our admitted list of students, uh, this was a new uh, venture, we quickly sort of did a number of meetings with the different offices, student services, financial aid, bursa, the places where they would have tons of questions, um, some of the separate deans, the academic dean, the dean himself. This was an effort to stay in contact, keep, um, keep sort of the energy towards things are still moving forward, everything is fine, answering questions as they came up. Um, and, and really sort of address it on a case by case basis. But uh, that, that is what we had to shift to virtual interviews almost immediately. And we'll probably be doing so in the fall. Um, nationally, the, case, the issue of applying to med school was approached from, all, from both of the associations. So the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine um, published uh, and a letter to all applicants saying that uh, for at least for the spring semester, because if you're applying to med school, that spring semester for some students is when you're preparing your application for medical school um, to go to the ACOMA services. Uh, and so that's when grades for the semester are being collected, labs, MCAT to take the MCAT. So this impacted everyone and almost immediately both ACOM as well as the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges that administers the MCAT test um, responded to the students, letting them know first of all that um, at least for the COVID cycle that they'd be accepting pass, fail, satisfactory, unsatisfactory coursework online coursework, even in the prerequisite courses. Um, and then the AAMC stepped up to lessen, I don't know if you heard about this, Dr. Brennan, they lessened the MCAT seat time. So typically to take the medical college admission test, it's about seven and a half hours. They lessened it for to five and 45 hours and 45 minutes for a time period from May to September. This is to give, because a lot of students were being canceled out of the MCATs they were already scheduled for in March and April. So the AAMC stepped up and said, this is what we're gonna do. In response to this, we're gonna um, shorten, lessen the, the MCAT seat time. They were also expanding the testing calendar. They were waiving rescheduling fees. And there's there's a lot of amenities that have come through nationally, all the medical schools, as well as the associations to say, you know what, this during this COVID season, if you're applying and you've been impacted, this is how we're gonna support you. Wow, thank you. And, uh, and Dr. Um, Dr. Lamy, I'm sure that we've got a lot of people listening who are interested in, in college admissions. Now, my sense is that when all this happened, admissions were basically done. A lot of the decisions, the, even the regular decisions, tend to happen in mid-March. So that part was done, I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but that there's clearly a lot of uncertainty going into this next year of what college admissions looks like. Well, for most colleges, 
um, continue to admit through May 1st. So, so it was, okay. the, yeah, that, that's okay. just the standard practice. Um, we actually admit through August. So we were okay. not done in March. We were actually at the peak of kind of finishing, you know, our class for, for fall 2020. Um, we, similar to Dr. Daddy, we went through um, virtual events, open houses, you know, we've done all of those things and in virtual interviews and but we shifted. I have to say that um, I'm very impressed with the admissions team because, you know, I don't know what the outcome will be because we deal with in, in, the, high, in the undergrad world, we, do, we deal with summer melt and summer melt happened prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. So uh, technically we're trending very well for the class that we want to bring in in the fall. Mm -hmm. However, um, typically a college will lose anywhere from 10 to 15% of its admitted students through the summer milk, meaning that the student committed to you, then they decided to go elsewhere, then, you know, they made a last minute decision or they decided to defer the admission to another time. Um, now, uh, the concern that we have in the undergraduate world right now is what does that look like in the days of COVID? Um, particularly when you're, the increase from students um, on a daily basis is, uh, if we go strictly online, I'll probably defer my admission. That's a reality that young people are dealing with right now. They're mm -hmm. saying that they want a college experience. They don't want to start college the way they finish high school. And, you know, for, for these young folks, you know, they miss their prom, miss their graduation. You know, high school is very different wrapping up. And they don't want to start their college experience in the same way that they ended their high school experience. So what you what we're receiving is a number of calls saying, that, are you going online? Or are you going to, are students going to be able to live on campus? Or are they, are they going to be able to go to class? And if they're not, we may rethink our choice to start in the fall. So the concern there, it's not just a Bloomfield concern, it's a, it's a concern that every college in the undergrad world should, should have right now, is what's going to happen this summer if we have to go completely online, what impact will that have on not only returning students who really hated the shift, you know, and, um, but also new students who really don't want to start this way. Right. And with that, um, you know, when we planned this symposium, um, the country looked like it was, it was uh, infection rates for COVID-19 were decreasing, um, hospitalizations were decreasing, um, and just, just in the three weeks since we, we were doing this, the, the picture nationally has changed pretty significantly. Right. So, um, Yes, there's no doubt that a lot of these kids want to be on campus, but um, I know that there are families who are, who are asking, how will you approach campus safety? Mm -hmm. Well, so that's, a, that's a big I'm question seeing. right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and quite honestly, um, my okay, first response, I'm sorry, go ahead. I th you want me to start? No, no, go ahead. Okay. No, no, my, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay. My first response is that um, when we talk about safety, it's really safety for the entire community. I mean, that's really what how we look at safety. Um, how do we protect our students? How do we protect our faculty? How do we protect our staff and our community? So we're doing everything we can in our power to follow the CDC guidelines on how to reopen. And we have all of these parameters to follow in New Jersey in particular, because every governor issue their own parameters, even though some may look alike, but based on where you are in the country, things are very different. Um, we happen to be right outside of New York and Dr. Daddy is in New York. Is in New York. And so what we're going to do, be bound by, is going to be very different than somebody out in the Midwest. And so for those parents who are asking the questions, we're providing every student with personal protective equipment of every kind. Um, we're limiting their, we're, we're, we're changing the, the, the flow patterns in every single room on campus, including the cafeteria. Um, social distancing in the cafe, if, we're, if they're allowed to go in, which right now they're not in New Jersey, there's no indoor dining right now. So um, that's the challenge we have. And in the case of our plans, we have to do grab and go in different locations so that, um, so that students can pick up their meals as they, or we do delivery as well. We're planning for quarantine housing in case we have an outbreak. There's a lot of moving pieces. and. So people in our roles, what we have to do, and I, and I sit on the COVID task force since I, I would imagine we started the task force at least uh, two months ago. And that was a task force to deal with reopening. Um, not, not being aware of when we could reopen, but we knew we had to plan for it. 
And so right now we're looking at um, teaching, which I mentioned earlier. How do we set up the classroom? How do we set up our, our um, computer labs to make sure that we have plastic over the keyboards, give every student a glove when they walk in, they have to wear their mask. Um, wearing your face, facial covering is going to be the norm on our campus. And you know, unless you're in your room about to go to bed, it's gonna be expected that you have a mask on. I mean, that's the reality that we're in. And so it, it affects us the same way when we go into a, um, a store and we forget our mask in the car. Have you been to that, to that experience that you forget your mask in the car and you gotta, you gotta run back in it? <laughs> so um, yeah. our students are gonna go through that and we're setting up contingency plan to distribute masks throughout the campus. Um, so it's a lot of work. And what I do tell parents is um, we have to be responsible. And, uh, and we have a responsibility to your young man or young, young woman on this campus. And we're not going to disappoint you. We're not going to disappoint them because if we do, we disappoint ourselves because we have to live in this space with them. You know, outside of the planning for the dorms, I would say we, we have the same challenges and we're preparing for the same. You know, I think we're going to be hybrid, that some of the classes mm -hmm. that we can be done remotely will be. Um, our challenges, the hands-on experiences, the labs where you have to have, uh, you have to be in person. And right now, I think that might be smaller groups. Uh, we are also looking at reconfiguring, you know, travel throughout the building, you know, one way up a stairway, one way down a stairway, mm -hmm. how many people can in an elevator. I mean, it gets granular, but um, that's what um, the dean is currently working on. And others of us that have come to even think about how we're going to meet with students. You know, my office is a pretty busy office of COVID-19. I have a, a full day of traffic of students coming to me. Well, that's now all going to change, but I can do that by Zoom. We won't lose that contact. It just has to be different. Um, because as Dr. Lamy said, you know, we have to be responsible and protect everyone. Um, and when you consider that some of the professors are, you know, of a certain age, you know, may be compromised and, you know, all sorts of things. Even the students themselves may have family members who are compromised. You just have to you take all necessary precautions, you know. Right. And, you know, that's really uh, that's really important because I think one of the things that we've been figuring out in this pandemic, too, is that, you know, I said campus safety um, and you hear the term safe reopening a lot, but maybe in some ways there's no such thing. You know, all we can do is mitigate and put layers of safety, but that's that's sometimes hard for for families to accept that there is this this concept that we can't provide perfect safety. But I think that's that's the scenario we're in right now with the with this pandemic is um, is you have as many layers of safety as you can, but unfortunately there's some inherent risk, and you focus on protecting your most vulnerable. Um, but uh, there's also the part about a social contract um, that the students themselves have to be responsible and take care of each other and take care of the faculty and take care of their campus community. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. I think in New York right now, Marjorie, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, there was a statement put out that if you were traveling from certain states, mm -hmm. uh, there is a mandatory requirement of a two-week um, quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, that, that has to be in effect before sort of starting in earnest. But um, mm -hmm. there are so many factors that go into this. Uh, the planning is nonstop, as Dr. Lamy yeah. said, because um, as you've put one plan into place mm -hmm. and you hear new COVID stats, you know, it uh, impacts something else. So um, I think this is an ongoing conversation. Right. So uh, you've got, I, I, you've clearly been extremely thoughtful about this and, um, and looking at hybrid models and in no scenario are kids really together as they're used to being. Um, what are your plans to just try to maintain that sense of community that's, that's so important for an academic environment? Well, I'll tell you, um, as I mentioned earlier, my staff surprised me and we learned so much this past semester.
Um, one of my directors threw a, um, and this is this is gonna blow your mind. He threw a three DJ region party on on online, and, and so um, and this, this was unreal to me. So of course, the first one, I told you know most of, most of the staff logged in too. We just wanted to see what it was like. It was kind of three DJs coming on streaming, and everybody was on Zoom. I mean, the room was so full. You, I could even. All I know is when I looked at the feed, it was upwards of 400 people on there. And, and, and I know I didn't know, couldn't see who else was on it. Wow. And uh, it was awesome. streaming on on that platform, on, on Instagram, on Facebook, Facebook Live. It was all over the place. And so what I've learned from that and all of the other events that we did remotely and, uh, and all the stu student groups that started as remote groups uh, and checking in on a regular, on a weekly basis, um, we have these open hours when we just we just get online and people just fall in in and out. <laughs> and, uh, that works. And so what I've learned was that um, our students were ready for this kind of engagement. We just weren't prepared to to, to we had to be. They were ready for it. And um, so I, I don't think um, I think we're going to be more effective in the long run, to be honest with you. And some, some people may disagree with that. I think the combination of when we do go back to in-person um, interactions and virtual is going to be a successful one. Um, I think that we've learned something special and this is the most commuter student involvement that I've ever seen in my career. And when I have an event virtually, if it's at seven o'clock at night on our campus, I will probably have two or three commuter students attending. If this is seven o'clock virtual event, I have a couple of hundred. I mean, that's the reality of what's changed because they, they'll do it from home and they'll still feel part of the community. So I think that, um, you know, we're going to be a little bit more effective building community, having a combination of those two worlds. Absolutely. I would I would I would second that motion, actually. The students and I've been learning about all these new apps that they've got. There's mm -hmm. House Party app, Google Hangout. I mean, they know all of them, um, and they've been using that to actually chat groups to to keep their little student organizations and that engagement going. So it hasn't really stopped. It's gotten more effective, um, and that was a nice surprise. So I would I would agree with with that comment. Mm -hmm. And with, at the beginning, we talked about mental health, um, that there, I mean, this, these past several months, there have been so many incredible stressors on our young people. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and again, I think culturally, there's, there's a part of uh, some Haitian American communities where speaking about mental health issues is, is not always easy um, and asking for help. Um, what are some of your thoughts on, on how students can navigate just the mental health risks that are out there right now? So, um, I, I, and I love that question. I was prepared mm -hmm. for this one specifically um, <laughs> because I, you know, I want to speak to the advocates in the student's life. And that, it doesn't matter what role you play, whether you're the mom, dad, big sister, little brother, cousin, mm -hmm. best friend. Um, I think there are things that we need to be aware of um, and, and uh, that, you know, you can play a part. And I think one of the things um, that I appreciate is not to underestimate the power of a safe space to vent. You know, they're in school and are dealing with a lot of challenges, not only academically, but also about what our future looks like. Um, there's a great power in just sitting with someone and just venting and saying, you know, today was a tough day and I don't know. And what do you think? Um, and being that voice um, or that listening ear is a powerful tool to just let them, you know, um, just be for a second. The other thing um, I, I think is critically important is giving them permission encouraging them and giving them permission to not participate in the family function if they have to study, to not run those errands for you if they have to study. Uh, because students feel um, conflicted 
about saying, you know, I really can't. I really shouldn't. I've got this major exam on Monday. I've got to do well. There's a lot of pressure. They don't want to say no. They don't want to not participate. Uh, but it's critically important for them. They took, um, they're indebted and, and they took, a, they made a commitment to participate in school. Um, and so let them know it's okay to sort of step out for a few hours and study. The other thing is be mindful of the environment. If they're back home with you and you've got a noisy household, you know, mm -hmm. check in, you know, is this okay for you to study? You know, how can I help you here? You know, can we create a space in the attic, in the basement, wherever, what can we do? Can we step out if that's possible when you need to study or do you need to go somewhere else? Um, whatever that looks like. Um, and, and, and ask, is there an exam coming up? What's your schedule like? I'll never forget the conversation I had with one um, with one person who was indicating how stressed they felt after they they were they had a weekend where someone was sending them all these forwards. You know that the incidents have not stopped ever since the George George Floyd situation. They were like, "Oh my God, my head is bursting," and I thought, you know, people sometimes don't realize you know, the students are, are busy with other things. So if you found, if you got something that's upsetting to you, it's going to be upsetting to them if you forward it. So before you forward it, check in, what's going on? How's your schedule? Is there any, you might just find out there's a big exam tomorrow. So you may not want to forward that right then and there. Um, and then maybe just have a conversation about it. Maybe they need to vet. I can't believe I just saw that. Um, the other thing is our students are super conflicted. They want to be out there protesting and, 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 and marching and doing all of that. But they're in school and they have to prepare for something that's major um, and recognize that our success is their success. So that that is a part of dismantling um, this history of racism when we can support all of them to reach their goals, to be success, to be as successful as they want to be. There are plenty of other ways that they can make their mark, uh, but just give them that permission because they're so conflicted and so incredibly um, overwhelmed by what's going on. Um, so this is an act added stressor. And so um, thank you for giving me that opportunity to say that because that was something that I really want, you know, our families and friends and, and advocates in their lives to be more aware of. Check mm -hmm. in, you know, just ask how's it going. Thank you. Thank you so much. I completely agree with that. And um, but I'm also going to, I want to speak on a, on a perspective of being a Haitian American um, and, you know, and the Haitian students that I deal with, that I serve, and their, their level of discomfort sometimes seeking personal counseling. And, and I think that as a Haitian community, we need to kind of work harder to, to make sure that our young men and women um, see that as an opportunity for self-help, for and it's a healthy change, it's a healthy conversation. And, and, you know, and sometimes when I hear, I'm going to say something in Creole for those who can speak Creole <laughs> and, uh, who are listening. Um, when I hear my students say, uh, you know, I told my parent I was going to the counseling center to see the psychologist. He said, Oof, fool. you know, that, like, you know <laughs> and, and I said, wow, I said, we still in this space. We have to get out of the space because um, our young men and women were struggling with just adjusting to college before COVID. Right. Um, before this disruption that I said earlier, this is a disruption to our world as we know it. Before the, the, the disruption came, they were already struggling. So now the struggle is, is heightened. And um, counseling staff, as I mentioned to you, are their level of activity is nonstop. And so if they're nonstop, that means that there's a lot of students out there who are needing the support. And so my suggestion for those who are parents in the audience who are listening, um, make sure you encourage your young men and women to get help, keep an open mind, keep an open heart, 
this is hard enough before this period. Um, don't be a, a, a blocker to their success. Agreed. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, 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 if anything, we have become uh, so inspired by our young people because they have had almost everything thrown at them these past few months. Um, and uh, they're, they're passionate and they're engaged and they care. Um, and, you know, they have such strong ideals of where they want to go, but there's, there's no doubt that this is a, tr a tremendous mental toll on them. And that openness to say that it's okay to, to say I need help um, and for friends and family to support them in that is, is just so key. So thank you for, for that, those comments. Um, so that is clearly one of the ways that families can support our kids right now um, is, with, uh, is with supporting their mental health. Any other um, tips on family to, for our families to support their young people who may be returning to um, college or graduate school in the fall? Um, I would just say to encourage, continue to encourage healthy habits, uh, you know, around the dinner table, you know, you may notice that a family member <laughs> is shrugging off COVID-19. No, it's a joke. You know, it's just a flu. Um, and, you know, have create that space to have those conversations and say, you know, we have to protect one another. Uh, continue to support and demonstrate healthy habits by wearing your mask and um, creating a designated space for um, proper cleaning and, and being mindful about where you're traveling to. Um, we, we, there, there's a number of ways to support. There, 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 I, we probably couldn't even name it all, but I think as long as people move forward with being as sensitive as possible to not only the student in your life, what they're going through, uh, but also what's going on around the home, around the environment, and how you're planning um, family gatherings, um, if you're having them at all, and mm -hmm. talking through um, what the next year is going to look like. If we spend next year under this whole COVID thing, um, COVID-19 stress, what will that mean for socialization? And if they really indeed do need that counseling to deal with any depression or anxiety that, you know, you're not coming at it from a judgmental place. Uh, we really have evolved. And I think culturally what happens is in the Haitian communities in the past, you know, that was a category, you know, like there wasn't really, um, that much information about mental health, but we've evolved tremendously around it. And people are successful every day who battle mental health issues. Um, and, and if you don't know, I would say, talk to someone to get more resources before um, you, you know, you're judgmental. There, there's so much information and schools have gotten a lot better about protecting students and their confidentiality. So I know that that's a part of the scare too, is if you go to the counseling office, is this gonna show up on your record? Is this gonna show up on your recommendation letter? Um, and we've gotten, we've, the school the school system I can say has really evolved and, and the student is first and protected in that regard. Um, so I, I just think, you know, we can do a lot more as a community, um, as families to support these students and encourage them to, to seek the, the mental health support that they need. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Lamy? No, I think Dr. Daddy covered that extremely <laughs> well. Yeah. I don't have anything to add to that at all. Okay. All right, so we're going to uh, take a little time to take some questions. Um, and then at the end of the questions, we'll have a chance to, to do some, some summary uh, uh, comments. But um, uh, I think we're going to be able to see the questions on screen. We can cue those up, please. Mm. 
Mm. Wild, me... wild, go ahead. <laughs> well, while, the, while, while we're queuing up the questions, um, mm -hmm. I did, uh, I, I had another question for you, and, and that is, there, again, one of the things that is causing stress to a lot of students is just with the disruptions of even summer plans. You know, lots of young people either had internships that were canceled or jobs that they had been offered that were pulled because the company started, got into financial problems. Um, uh, particularly for things where kids were hoping to get some things done over the summer that was going to help them get into college or help them get into grad school. Excuse um, me, what points do you have? I, I think right now, and I, for our new graduates who are graduating into this new normal, which I hate calling it, um, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I think it's time to be a little bit more creative to, to consider continuing to grad school. I mean, that's really what I think this time is for, retooling yourself, because um, the job market is very different. And for those who had internships this summer um, that didn't find a way to do it remotely, and I know of a, a number of students who did find a way to have a remote internship, and it was very, very successful with it. Um, so, and, and the other thing I was saying to those students is um, those are challenges, but they're also opportunities. Um, the challenge, sometimes the challenge forces you to reimagine your actions and what you can do to, to resolve them. And I think at this point, if I'm a new graduate and the workforce is not uh, really a, a place where I can find some security, I would consider retooling myself to see what can I do, one, differently, that in this new remote space to, 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 to earn a living, two, what can I do with my education to kind of retool myself so that when, when the workforce becomes a little bit more viable, that I have greater opportunity than I have now. Um, I, I would agree with that statement. What I've noticed is some students are using this time to um, get their volunteer experiences uh, remotely. Uh, that's a part of the medical school application process. So where they can, they're finding these opportunities, but it, it is tough right now um, in, in terms of the job market. So retooling is an excellent strategy. That's fantastic advice. Thank you. Um, so are we ready to do questions? I think we can uh, see if the audience has any questions for our panelists. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> so um, we've got a question that says, uh, uh, what do you recommend that foreign students do if their college is going virtual in the fall? Oh, great question, especially in light of some of the uh, <clears throat> political statements that have come from the president about um, having international students return. So please. I think those, um, that's a great question and the choices are very limited. And I, I'm gonna tell you what they are. <laughs> they're, they're very limited. Um, and, the, and, it, the, and none of them are easy. One is to perhaps transfer to a place where they're not remote only. And that's, that's option number one. Um, and no one wants to do that. If they find a place where they were comfortable, nobody's ready to do that. A few of my students are in that same space right now, uh, you know, and trying to figure out what they're going to do. Um, the plan we currently have will facilitate their enrollment. If that should change and we completely align, it will put a student exactly in this particular situation. Write your local congressman, um, get some people in D.C. to kind of force this agenda. This is a political issue. It's bigger than higher ed, and, um, but it has a tremendous impact on higher ed right now, particularly for international students who are blown away by the fact that um, not only is it difficult for you to get home under normal circumstances, to get home during COVID, to, to, are you allowed to return home because your country may not re welcome you back home based on COVID-19? You know, There's so many pieces to this thing that the choices right. are very limited, but one is to fight it. Two is to look at your alternative and find another institution. And, and, I, and sometimes people don't like me to say that because I'm in higher ed. I want my students going anywhere else, but I also don't want them to be in a position where they just don't have options. I think everybody deserves an option and some alternatives. But the first option is to challenge the situation as best as you can. Right people to make sure that this is public and so that they understand the impact. 
Um, a lot of times, you know, federal government makes policies without, make very uninformed policies, meaning that the people think it's a good idea and it's not all policies are good for everybody. So I think it's, voices need to be heard on this issue a little bit more. Agreed. Nothing more to add. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, such an incredibly unfortunate um, situation with that going on right now, and and it it is just political. And unfortunately, it's it's our young people are that are being caught in the crosshairs with it. So, um, I hope we get a lot of activism um, to to try to fight this. Um, do we have an, uh, the next question? <clears throat> Thank you for your comments, everyone. Do you believe that the silver lining of this pandemic and civil unrest is creating more mental health related jobs? This was a neglected industry in some way. Um, ironically, I mean, I don't know if it's creating more jobs, but it's creating more focus on mental health. We have always had a wellness uh, piece in our curriculum. We have uh, we've invested in a 24-hour student assistance program. We have a full-time social worker. We have a wellness uh, committee. Uh, but I think what this does for sure is make people understand the importance of mental health um, to your overall being, you know, and how important it is that we support one another. Um, and, and I think the jobs have always been there but they've been neglected or they've not been, they've not received the, the proper um, recognition. I agree. What can we do to get Haitian people with differing political opinions to join forces and unite as one against the disparities caused by COVID-19? <laughs> I guess I'm not sure what the difference, different political opinion actually is <laughs> to help to answer that. You, um, I'm not sure what the differing political opinion would be. So I guess the person who posed that question, if they can just elaborate on that so that we can kind of have a better opportunity to, to address that with a response. And, uh, you know, I think within the Haitian community, if there tends to be um, some differences, particularly generational um, in how they view politics mm -hmm. um, and uh, disparities and, and how engaged they are with non-Haitians. Um, it's interesting because unfortunately COVID-19 was devastating to Haitian communities. I mean, we look at New York and Brooklyn and Queens. Um, right. it, it, it was, was incredibly um, devastating to our community. And we're seeing that now going to other places is a kind of interesting because initially it was very easy for some in the country to say, oh, it's just New York. Um, and now of course it's Texas and it's Arizona and it's Florida. Um, but, uh, but there's no doubt that um, you know, I think that's been part of why we've had so much civil unrest is because COVID has almost ripped off that that cover of these um, health disparities that were were prevalent in our country. So, right. Great point. What advice would you give to both Haitian parents and students to mentally and physically prepare them for the uncertainties of the 2021 school semesters? Um, so I think um, one of the things that families can do, um, this is an excellent time to get closer. Uh, you know, we are a country, we're a city, we're always busy. When we're not in school, we're working, we're working out, we're partying, we're beaching. You know, we, we're used to, as a country, um, nonstop activity. And what COVID-19 has done is... Uh, stopped us dead, uh, dead in our tracks and really refocused our attention to what we could touch and feel. And that is our families, right? Um, if, if it's not in person, it's virtually. And so I think one of the things um, that families can do, and this is related to what Dr. Lamy said about retooling, is having honest conversations about 
what do we want the next two years to look like for us? Mm-hmm. One of COVID-19, if it did nothing else, it showed you where the gaps are, where you need more help, where you need to rethink, restructure. How do we get there together? You know, and this is the best opportunity to do that because you're not going anywhere soon, right? Nobody's going on a vacation to, you know, and nobody's hopping on a plane. So you're almost forced to um, spend some quality time really investigating what's deep in the hearts of each other. What are the long-term goals? If, If you're going to go back to school, what does the end game look like? Um, what do our finances look like as a family? What's the future plan? Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to have some honest conversation and plan for the future. And I, I would completely agree with that. And um, I would add that you want, if, you're, if your son or daughter is going to school right now, you want them to be careful. That's, that's really the this, this situation right now, um, young people have an opportunity to take some control of it, particularly college students. Uh, and to know that be careful, make smart decisions, particularly those who are going into college environments for the first time, who've been in the house for the past three or four months. This is not the this is not Freedomville that you're going to. This is not your newfound place to, to, to party and do the things that you can do in the past four months. This is the time to be responsible to be responsible for yourself, to be responsible to your peers and to be responsible to whatever community you're about to enter. Um, Because we all have to be in this together to survive this crisis that has disrupted our world. And so what I would tell my young men and women is when you go off to this campus or whatever campus that is, and there's a plan to assure that you're safe that says, you know, do not go gather in a room that's 12 by 12 with 20 other people, don't do it. Um, wear your mask, um, be careful, wear your gloves, um, be cautious, disinfect your area. And because uh, what you do or don't do has an impact for everyone else. The next person, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> okay. All right. So, wow, we've covered um, we've covered a lot today, and it's 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 such a huge topic. And I um, am so grateful that we've sort of had this chance to to think about um, what uh, comes next. And you know, one of the themes that I've I've really enjoyed hearing about is that we are all in this together, and that we sort of have a social contract with each other. Um, and that's kind of one of the ways that we're going to have to make this work in the fall um, is that we are responsible then and particularly for some of our young people who I know that right now they're not so impacted by COVID to understand that, you know, their favorite college professor um, might be very vulnerable and that all of us are going to be in, in, a, in a closed space or an or, or enclosed community and that we all need to be responsible for each other. Um, but I think um, there's there's growth and something kind of beautiful about that, about um, us all watching out for each other. Um, so you, I'd love to hear some closing comments from both of you, please. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I'm oh, we have another question person. out here. One more moment. I, we have another question oh, I've yeah, been told. Sure. <laughs> Okay. Huh. How do you feel about universities still charging full tuition for online classes? Well, you know, <laughs> this issue came up this past semester. Let me, there's, the, there's this um, perception that online classes are supposed to be less rigid, and, 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 uh, and that's completely not true. And so what I've learned this recent semester from some students and what they've learned is um, they were challenged more online than they were in person. So the the perception that online classes should be discounted because it's not an in-person course is really leads to another question. It's about the quality of the educational program of the curriculum. And if the curriculum quality is the same, the platform delivery is different, but the curriculum is the same. 
So my opinion is that the cost should remain the same as well. And I would just add that for graduate professional schools, um, you know, it costs to um, have clinical training and that doesn't happen on its own. Uh, so it would be the equivalent of saying you want a quality education, but we're not going to pay the professors. Um, so I think it's challenging. I understand where those questions are coming from, and it's because of that misperception. Uh, but it, 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 you know, it just costs to deliver a quality education. That's as much as I can say. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so please go ahead and um, if you have any final thoughts. Um, I would just say and really encourage students to know that they can do it. Um, this is a really challenging time and I get it, but utilize all of your resources. Uh, do not be afraid to talk to student affairs professionals. We have the tools to be able to assist you and advise you or at least connect you to the right individuals. Um, to the families, fam friends and advocates out there, uh, remember to keep in mind that yes, they're young, they're just in school, uh, but there's a lot of stress. You know, advocate for them doing their ultimate very best. They are the future. Um, and we're going to be made more successful if they're successful. Uh, so encourage them where you can, ask questions, check in with their day, check in with their schedules, um, and just encourage, continue to be a safe space of reasoning and support. Uh, they, they need it more than ever before. I will say, um, you know, be mindful of the COVID disruption in our lives. Um, I know I said that word many times because that's all I see <laughs> when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I think about all the things that's happened and I've lost family members and close friends and this is a very real situation. And so be mindful of that. This is a major disruption and be mindful of it. And if you're a person of faith, stay in prayer, um, however you choose to do that. But we all have a a global responsibility to deal with the situation. Where it's not just in the topic of higher education today, it's in anywhere in our lives. I mean, this impacts most people's work, job, um, family, no matter what you, 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 what topic you bring up, this has an impact on it one way or the other. So my, my suggestion would be to um, stay in hope, faith and prayer and be responsible to each other. Okay, well, this was really an incredible conversation. Um, Dr. Lamy, Dr. Daddy, thank you for taking the time. Um, I certainly uh, am inspired reading your bios and what you have accomplished in your lives. I think you're going to be an inspiration to not only just young people, but um, a lot of people on this call about you know just how incredibly talented our Haitian community is and to provide this really, really important information um, to our families. So thank you for taking the time. Um, good luck with, I know, a very, very busy couple of months that you all have approaching um, the start of these new semesters. And um, thank you everyone who joined this conversation today. Thank you for joining this virtual symposium put on by the National Association of Haitian Professionals. I want to give one more shout out to our sponsors who helped us make this possible. And of course, there are several people behind the scenes who set this up and allowed us to have this conversation. Um, so thank you, all of you at NAHP, for doing this incredibly important work. And thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Brandon. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good, Good night, night, everyone.